very thrilled to be here. It's a very special evening. To me, Barilan represents my Hashkafa, and to be honored in this way by the university, which represents Torah Mada, uh, Eretz Israel, and everything that I hold close is a wonderful feeling. It's also a big zuchut to be together with such a distinguished group of honorees, and I feel very much honored. איפה להעניק הערב דוקטורט כבוד לפובליציסט איזי ליבלר, הנוטל חלק בביצור מעמדה של ישראל בעולם ובהדיפת ניסיונות להטיל ספק בלגיטימציה שלה. בשורה משמחת בעניין זה הגיעה אמש מארצות הברית, כאשר רוב חברי האיגוד האנתרופולוגי האמריקני הצביעו נגד ההצעה להטיל חרם אקדמי על ישראל. ובעבר איזי פעל רבות למען יהדות רוסיה, יהדות רוסיה שמעבר למסך הברזל. וכיום אנו שמחים על כי העמיד לרשות האוניברסיטה אוסף ייחודי ונרחב של ספרי יהדות, אוסף מיוחד ונדיר, שישמשו את חוקרינו ואת הסטודנטים שלנו. תודה לך איזי. על כל פועלך למען העם היהודי בארץ ובתפוצות. יקצר המצע ויזל הזמן מלתאר את כל הישגיה של האוניברסיטה ואת רוחב פעילותה למען העם והחברה. ויפה ביטא את הדבר סופרנו הדגול, חתן פרס נובל לספרות שי עגנון, עוד בשחר כינונה של האוניברסיטה. אוניברסיטה שכזו, צורך השעה היא, וצורך האומה לצורך הארץ. האנשים שנבחרים אה, כדוקטורים לשם כבוד זה קבוצת אנשים יוצאת דופן, שמה שמאפיין אותם הוא בעצם שינוי בחברה, שינוי בעולם. העולם הוא אחר אחרי המעשים שלהם ואחרי העשייה שלהם מאשר הוא היה לפני, והוא אחר לטוב. בר אילן אוניברסיטי בסטוז אין אונררי דוקטורט אפון איזי ליבלר. an ardent advocate of the State of Israel and a world statesman in recognition of his tireless efforts to address the challenges facing the Jewish nation at every historic crossroad, from Soviet Jewry to BDS. Liebler's extensive and unique Judaic library collection, which he has generously donated to the university, demonstrates his reverence for Jewish sources and commitment to our heritage as the people of the book. I believe that uh, Barilan in a sense, represents the future of modern orthodoxy in Israel. Because Bar Ilan will prevent this country from polarizing between Chilonim and Haredim. An enlightened Torah Umada, which it stands for, is what I've been brought up to look towards in Jewish life. And our Jewish way of life is reflected in Jewish civilization in a published book. Books, to me, are the essence of life. I'm very glad that it's going to an institution like Bar Ilan, because Bar Ilan epitomizes for me what I would like to see Israeli society move towards. Torah, Mada, Zionism, the centrality of Israel, all of these are the aspects of which my library is based on. Bar Ilan University is proud to confer the degree of Dr. Honoris Causa upon Mr. Izzy Liebler.
The terrorism that we're experiencing now has two objectives. The first objective is to create an atmosphere of terror and instability within Israel itself. We'll overcome that, I have no doubt. The second one is more disconcerting because they are trying to create an atmosphere in which people from overseas will be frightened to come to Israel and will see Israel as a country which is a dangerous place. And it's in this context it has to be looked at as an extension of BDS. And to that extent, I think it's very, very important that we combat it and I'm hoping that friends of Israel will not be influenced and will continue coming because when the chips are down, as of now, you are still safer in, in, in Israel and even in Jerusalem than in, many, in most cities in, in Europe and in the rest of the world. BDS is basically a movement which is an attempt to isolate Israel and to use diplomatic and economic means by which to tear it apart and undo what was they could not do to Israel militarily. And it is pernicious in the sense that double standards apply, moral relativism comes into it. Uh, it is an awful movement because if anything reflects anti-Semitism, it's the BDS movement because Israel is singled out. And Israel is a unique country. It's like an oasis here in a sea of barbarism. And we are being kind of isolated by people who claim to be concerned about human rights. These people are turning towards Israel and ignoring the mayhem and the millions of people who have been displaced and killed around them and concentrating on the Jews. This to me is quite open anti-Semitism. The ridiculous thing about BDS is if it was practiced, if it was practiced really, you, you know, the world wouldn't be able to operate. People would not be able to use computers. People would not be able to use half the medical uh, uh, things that come from Israel. It's, it's nonsense. It is clearly an attempt to isolate areas in order to make Israel a pariah and in order to make Israel weak. My own view is that ultimately this is counterproductive not only to the countries that are doing it, but when you consider the Arabs who are living here, it harms them too. And believe me, the BDS movement has created problems for Arabs and employment and so forth. But they're not concerned about Arabs or anything. They're only concerned about one thing, try to undermine the state of Israel and Jewish sovereignty. That's the ultimate objective. Theoretically, it's possible, but in terms of practice, what has happened with the Arabs is that since the time of Arafat, the Palestinians have been transformed into a culture of death, a culture which extols destruction and death, and a culture which is based on hating the Jews and refusing to accept the legitimacy of the Jewish state. That is ultimately their objective. And those people that imagine that this is a fight over real estate, that this is a fight over territories, they're wrong. The Arabs could have had a uh, Palestinian state already many times in the past. And Ehud Olmert even foolishly offered them 95% of everything they wanted. And they still knocked it back. Why? Because their objective is not to have a Palestinian state. Their real objective is to see the demise of the Jewish state. And so long as we have duplicitous, corrupt creatures, that's the way I describe Abbas, in positions of power and continuing to control the education of a generation of kids to bring up this culture of death and destruction, I see no possibility of coming to any peace settlement. And we have to come to terms with trying to improve the position and the status of Arabs, Israelis, and bring us closer people to people, but forget about giving a Palestinian state, which would only be taken over anyway by the extremists. But I must say to you, the difference between the Palestinian administration and Hamas is one of strategy. It's not one of ideology. Both of them want to see the destruction of the state of Israel. Both engage in the worst forms of horrific anti-Semitism. So be under no illusions. One's not a nice guy, like the way we're put. And we have to go through this pantomime in order to make the world happy. We pretend that we're having discussions knowing that we're not going to get anywhere. We talk about our peace partner. He's no peace partner. He is a man who is committed to our destruction. And uh, 
His time has nearly come, but whoever will replace him, they're going to be the same, more of the same. So the answer to those that say, can we have an independent state next to us in the immediate future, impossible with these people. Not until they have a dramatic change in their leadership, which is not on the horizon. Well, Sadat wanted to have peace with Israel and he paid the price for it because the extremists ultimately killed him. And I believe that that would apply to most leaders today in most parts of the Arab world. I have some hope that perhaps the Egyptian Sisi may move in the right direction, but he's doing it very carefully and very slowly and the country still reeks of anti-Semitism and hatred of Jews but at least we have objective interests in fighting terrorists together. So that brings us together. But to make real peace is a real challenge for any Arab leader, and he puts his life in peril. I think there's one problem in the world today. They look upon us and the Palestinians as two people fighting one another. But when you look at the culture which is introduced from kindergarten stage. It's something which is so totally alien to a Western Christian Jewish civilization. They don't understand it because these people are brought up with the ultimate objective in life. The greatest way of achieving sanctity is to kill Jews and to go to heaven as a result of doing that. Now they're taught to be martyrs. They're taught to be shahids from the kindergarten age. And from that point on, the media, the television, and everything pumps hatred and hatred and hatred and hatred into them. It is a culture of death. It is a monstrosity. And it is in many respects, there are many parallels between the Palestinians, who as a people are not bad people, they're good people. But if you take the Palestinians under Arafat and all these other people that have educated them, it's like the Germans. The Germans were also transformed from being good people into monsters, and again, they're good people. I'm hoping that perhaps a day will come, maybe not in my life, but a day will come when there will be Arabs arising to become leaders that will bring about peace and overcome this hatred and come to terms with the fact that we are here to stay. We seem to be living in a world where we have become so intimidated that the moment we look at anything related to Islam, we are under attack for what is called Islamophobia. And that's nonsense, because what is really happening is that we are being pressured by Islamic extremists to adopt their standards, to move in their direction, and to not have the right to criticize them, despite the fact that some of the things they're doing are totally contrary to Western concepts, totally contrary to human dignity and to decency. This is one of the big problems that we face in the Western world because people think that they're being liberal by being kind to these people. Well, it's like, to my mind, being kind to Nazis. When you have an element which is evil, you've got to stand up and fight it. The real, one of the real problems the Jews and Christians have to work together with is to recognize the fact that much of the world today is engaged in moral relativism and they see no distinction between good and bad, between good and evil. We are still believing that their world is made up of good people and bad people and good people must fight bad people. I think that in the Western world and even in the United States and particularly in the campuses and it's even starting, I understand, now in the schools. Textbooks are emerging which have been influenced by Islamic forces to distort reality. Now this is something which is quite dangerous because if this continues and children are brought up with a distorted view of the reality of the world and of the threats that the world face, it will have terrible consequences for us in the long term and we should fight it and stand up and point out when these textbooks come out, point out if they are wrong, 
demand that they be corrected and not allow influences from ex external influences to impose upon us alien ideas. One of the extraordinary developments which has taken place in the last 20 or 30 years is as Israel lost the sympathy of the left and of liberals, we developed a closer rapport with Christians, particularly evangelicals. And to me, it's an extraordinary development because in the past there was never quite, there were Christian Zionists, but there was never a mass movement of such love towards Jews, which is exhibited with genuine feelings. And I've had a lot of dealings with these people, I have enormous respect for them, and I consider them extraordinarily important for the Jewish people and allies, and we are both. And what I'm happy about is it's, it's a one of the few Christian denominations which is growing and growing powerfully, whereas the others are shrinking. They have faced up to anti-Semitism in the past. They are trying to build up a relationship with the Jews, and they believe from Genesis that God will bless them if they are good to the Jews. Now, to me, this is not missionarizing. Needless to say, if there's mission is if, if if there's attempt to convert us, there would be enormous uh, resistance to that. But the friendship that is shown by most of them is something that has to be extolled. And unfortunately, the chief rabbinate in Israel has been, a, in a sense, hijacked by extremists. They don't represent anything except the extreme element. And they came out; they were fed nonsense that this is a missionary movement and told Jews to keep away from it. But I can tell you, and you could see in the streets, when we had the visits of the evangelicals here at the uh, tabernacles, the average Israeli appreciates them, loves them, and it gives them enormous strength and courage to know that we have support like that. To my mind, the uh, Friends of Israel and the Christian movement are, in many respects, even in the United States, as important and sometimes more important than the Jewish lobby itself. And uh, sometimes the passion they, ex they express and convey uh, really warms me up and I get a lot of letters from them and I really do appreciate them. I've had dealings with them and they're impeccable in their approach and we're very, very fortunate to have such friends. The refugee problem is not a problem. It's something that we have created ourselves and it's a problem which, in effect, the Arabs imposed upon us and used as a dagger against us to maintain the plight of these people. When you look at the enormous integration that has taken place of Jews from Arab countries, you wouldn't know that they were refugees. They're all integrated here. When you look at the changes that have taken place throughout the world, in Korea, in India and in Pakistan, these refugees have all disappeared. When you look at the European situation after the war, there are no more refugees. The only refugees that are being kept from generation after generation after generation are the Arab refugees, and it's a political instrument against us. And it is despicable because they could easily be integrated, and the money that's being poured there is catastrophic, especially catastrophic when most of that comes from Western sources, including the United States, whilst the Arab countries, the oil-rich Arab countries, are importing labour from anywhere except their own, but will not do anything to help their own people. It is one of the ugliest aspects and most cynical aspects of Arab policies, and we are collaborating with it by participating in it. When I, hear, when I hear the word apartheid applied to Israel, my blood boils because I would challenge you to go into any Israeli hospital, to go into any Israeli mall, to go and look at the Supreme Court of Israel, look at the Parliament of Israel. You've got Arabs in all of those places despite the fact that many of them are radicals and many of them are really saying bad things about their own country. And to use the, the, the expression apartheid, especially coming from people who have the most inhuman abuse of human rights in their own countries, to me is an abomination and reflects the hypocrisy of the world that stands by and puts equal blame, or more often, concentrates all its ire on Israel. 
which is trying to live a life of peace and coexistence. The enormous hysteria we have today about refugees kind of makes you say, why all of this hysteria now? Why in the last 70 years has nothing been done to integrate the Palestinian refugees? And we know the answer to that. But I will, stay, I will go one step further and say that as a Jew, when I see a refugee, I feel for anybody in that particular context, knowing what Jews went through before the Holocaust when they were unable to escape from Nazism. But the Europeans are digging their own graves today if they are going to bring in large numbers of people who are saturated with hatred, anti-Western uh, concepts and anti-democracy. They are bringing in jihadists amongst them. And if you look at the average age of the people that are coming out as so-called refugees, they're all young men. 70% of them are young men, hardly what you would call refugees. Many of these are just simply looking for, better, for a better life in Europe. Now, if they succeed, then millions more will want to follow them and get out of the hell of the Middle East in which they're living in, instead of fixing up their own countries. And if that happens, it'll be the end of Western civilization in Europe. Netanyahu's speech at the United Nations was, as always, outstanding. And it was not a speech designed just for Jewish consumption. It was a warning to the world. Alas, nobody's listening to him. And I am deeply concerned about where we're going if the current trends are not reversed. What has happened with Iran is beyond belief and will go down in the annals of history as one of the most terrible outrages. This was not a negotiation. This was a capitulation. This makes somehow or other Chamberlain and Munich, when they gave in and appeased the Nazis, it makes it look like a picnic. What Obama has done here is, to my mind, a crime against the world and it's a terrible situation because setting aside even the nuclear element, he has strengthened a regime which is the most extreme terrorist regime. A terrorist regime which says publicly it hates the West, death to America, death to Israel, and it repeatedly says it's going to destroy us. What other country would say something like that and have the United States lift embargoes and co cooperate with them and say, look forward to some sort of collaboration? This is a terrible, terrible situation and one which I fear uh, we will, our children will reap the consequences of because this has strengthened them immensely and we're going to have to face up to them one day. Thank God Israel is very, very strong, but it's a terrible threat for the rest of the world and it's only going to create more chaos here in the Middle East, which is already a chaotic country with millions of people displaced and hundreds and hundreds of thousands killed. You know what a hypocrisy it is. There are hundreds of thousands of people being killed, thousands every day sometimes. And what do we have? We have the United Nations sitting down there, Security Council, when we open up another apartment or another block of, of offices or of homes in a residential area in Jerusalem. That warrants a Security Council censure, but not, God forbid, the millions who have been displaced and the horrors that are taking place there. I mean, we're going back to the sixth century, the dark ages, and all they can do is concentrate on Israel, which is the only bright spot in the area. I would today urge Americans to review the situation very, very carefully, and when they appoint their leaders, try to get back to a situation where they take responsibility for leadership of the world because there's only one country which has the capacity, the strength and the power of leading the world. That is the United States. And by withdrawing and creating all these vacuums and allowing evil people to come in and take over, that is why things have gone so bad. And I would hope that the next leader of America will go back 
to fundamentals and will lead the world because that is America's role today, to play the position of leading the world and exerting influence for stability and peace in the world, linking up with its allies and distancing itself from rogue states instead of trying to engage or grovel towards them. That's what I would like to see the American people and its leaders move towards in the future. Thank <laughs> you.